Well, welcome everybody. I think we will go ahead and get started and let those who come in uh, find out uh, the rules will be the same as they were last time. You are now all muted, I see, courtesy of Courtney. And uh, she will give you a quick uh, reminder of how to use the raise hand feature now. All right, so if you have a question, please uh, use the raised hand feature, which you can find under uh, reactions in the, the lower uh, navigation. If you click on that, there's a hand up that says raise hand and just click that and, and we will call on you. If you wish to give it a test, now would be the time. Courtney can disable, or can, she can turn them off. Her, she can turn them off for you if you don't know how to turn them off. But if you need a practice time, now's the time to do that. Okay, well, let's get started. So today's chapters are uh, 10 through uh, 16. Kind of the time, the part in, in a, in maybe a bigger book where Dickens would be sort of expanding the story. And um, there's a little bit less of that, I think, in, in the, the uh, what's the word I want? The uh, constrained time frame of, use, of using just 12 monthly installments instead of 20. But I think this, this the chapter opens with somewhat an unusual uh, moment. I would call it a parenthesis on how, um, how women have an ability to discern the characters of men, it, uh, it, it appears to apply in directly to the case of uh, Mrs. Chris Barkle, but uh, it does seem to be um, oddly uh, general in its, its uh, presentation. Um, but I do wanna talk about Mrs. Chris Barkle's closet because this is, one of my favorite parts in all of Dickens, and it's certainly one of my favorite parts of this particular chapter. And I am going to ask Megan, since she's got her book in front of her head, to read the entire paragraph about Mrs. Chris Barkle's cabinet. And it starts on page 100 in the Penguin uh, with the phrase, as whenever the Reverend Septimus fell amusing. You're on mute, Megan. Sorry, I thought I had as whenever the Reverend Septimus fell amusing, his good mother took it to be an infallible sign that he wanted support. The blooming old lady made all haste to the dining room closet to produce from it the support embodied in a glass of Constantia and a homemade, homemade biscuit. It was a most wonderful closet, worthy of cloister ham and of the minor canon corner. Above it, a portrait of Handel in a flowing wig beamed down at the spectator with a knowing air of being up to the contents of the closet and of a musical air of intending to combine all its harmonies in one delicious fugue. No common closet with a vulgar door on hinges openable all at once and leaving nothing to be disclosed by, dis by degrees. This rare closet had a lock in midair where two perpendicular sides met slides met, the one falling down and the other pushing up. The upper slide on being pulled down, leaving the lower of a double mystery, revealed deep shelves of pickle jars, jam pots, tin canisters, spice boxes, and agreeably outlandish vessel vessels of blue and white. The luscious lodgings of preserved tamarinds and ginger, Every benevolent inhabitant of this retreat had his name inscribed upon his stomach, the pickles in a uniform of rich brown double-breasted buttoned coat, and a yellow or somber drab continuations announced their portly forms in printed capitals as walnut, gherkin, onion, cabbage, cauliflower, mixed, and other members of that noble family. The jams, as being of a less masculine temperament and as wearing curl papers announced themselves in feminine calligraphy like a soft whisper to be raspberry, gooseberry, apricot, plum, damson, apple, and peach. 
The scene closing on these charmers and the lower slide ascending, oranges were revealed, attended by a mighty Japan sugar box to tempt their acerbity if, unri if unripe. Homemade biscuits waited at the court of these powers, accompanied by a goodly fragment of plum cake and various slender lady fingers to be dipped into sweet wine and kissed. Lowest of all, a compact leaden vault enshrined the sweet wine and a stock of cordials, whence issued whispers of Seville orange, lemon, almond, and caraway seed. There was a crowning air upon this closet of closets, of having been for ages hummed through by the cathedral bell and organ until those venerable bees had made some uh, sublimated honey of everything in store. And it was always observed that every dipper among the shelves, deep, as has been noticed, and swallowing up head, shoulders, and elbows, came forth again mellow face and seeming to have undergone a saccharine transfiguration. So this takes up more than a page out of 250 pages of material. So it must be important. Why might this be important? Nancy. Hi, it's my first time and I, I'm sorry you can't see me. <laughs> my lighting isn't so good. I think, um, you know, it's described as sort of a monster that swallows you up. And I, to me, Dickens is talking about addiction here. Okay. And what do you see? What, what are the sig signals of addiction that you, that particularly come to your attention? Um, you know, the rosy and contented faces, the, the, what, uh, you know, how there's something there to tempt everyone. Um, he uses a lot of alliteration, the herbaceous penitentiary, um, botanical blotches, bunches of dried leaves hung from rusty hooks. That's later on, I guess. All that, um, that people are led to, like led to the slaughter, like lambs, when they, they come to the closet and sort of just quietly swallow what's given to them. Uh, to me, coupled with, you know, Jasper and the opium smoking, it well, they're not it felt just to me like he was making a commentary about that. They're not just swallowed up, they are transfigured. And I mentioned to all of my students in all of my seminars that whenever the word transfigured occurs, you need to pay attention because it means that the experience changes them in some way. And so, uh, Megan, your comments on this. You're muted. That's a very interesting point that she made, but my initial reaction was no, um, well, maybe in the next paragraph, it talks about the more negative aspects, but this is all Mrs. Prips, Chris Sparkle, who is, I think we talked last week about how she is um, maybe an antidote to a lot of the gloom and doom. All of the descriptions are quite um, fascinating, quite lovely, quite warm and quite um, tasty. Okay, Karen. Yeah, I, I would agree with um, Megan in that I see this as one of the nice, warm and fuzzy um, portions, and it's a welcome relief. Um, a comment in general about this book, I just, I've always wondered about my own response to it. Not that I don't like it and appreciate it, but I'm not drawn in the same way to it as I am some of the other Dickens. So I've struggled with what what is that about? And I was recently reading some of the books about Dickens that I have piled up. And this is um, the A.N. Wilson, mm -hmm. uh, The Mystery of Charles Dickens. He has an entire chapter in here on um, Edmund Drood, but Edmund Drood, but I think not nearly as insightful as a lot of what you said, Carl, so I'm not recommending it, but I did go to it. And he talks about atmospherics 
in this novel. And Dickens always, I mean, often uses atmospherics, referring to um, the weather, the surroundings, the trees, the wind, that kind of thing. And in this particular novel, the effects are intended to create, I think, a very particular mood of gloominess, foreboding, it's spooky, it's heavy, it's ominous. So this, this um, portion, anytime Mrs. Chris Sparkle perks up, I love her. <laughs> She's warm, it's a relief. It's like, oh my God, thank you. And you know, so often many of the Dickens that I return to, I hold with almost a reverence while I read it. And this one, I kind of keep at a distance. And I think that's a testimony again to the brilliance of the writing and the mood that's created, so. Thank you, Bill. Carl, you began by uh, noting that the chapter's first paragraph talks about the infallibility of uh, the female, of the <clears throat> uh, human kind to, to be able to understand what's going on. And, and so this, chap this particular paragraph says, as whenever Reverend Septimus fell amusing, his good mother took it to be an infallible sign that he wanted support. But everything that I read before that um, didn't indicate to me that Septimus needed support. And it was uh, another indication of uh, people misreading what's going on. OK. I'm going to keep asking this question until I'm fishing for several things, and none of you have come up with them yet. So let's keep going. What is going on in this page long digression into somebody's knickknack box? I mean, besides Dickens's famous use of lists of personifying objects and objectifying people, what is happening here? Marini, you're muted. That's exactly what I was going to say. Exactly. Um, it, it's a, I mean, in, in one sense, the very typical um, Dickens riff. I mean, he loves to do these lists and lists of, um, of whatever it is, food particularly, um, and he does it so well. No one else can do it like he does. Um, I'm, I don't feel like I have great insight into the importance of it, except that it's remarkable. It's remarkable. <laughs> least successful as a list and it's a remarkable closet but um i i don't know about well, metaphor well, well let me call attention to a couple of the items and spe uh, specifically constantia is a white wine from south africa um the blue and white jars are almost certainly from china tamarinds and ginger are not from around these parts. There is a Japand box, Seville oranges, and caraway seeds. What do those strike you as? Glenna. You're on, you're muted, Glenna. There, sorry, it took a while. Um, well, it represents the British Empire at full, um, you know, full tilt. Uh, importing goods from all over the world, uh, sometimes rather forcibly. But um, I also wanted to go back to the saccharine transfiguration phrase. Um, it seems to me, I mean, as someone who loves to cook, it is remarkable that uh, you can take something and transfigure it so mightily when you add baking powder to a batter and it becomes a cake. Um, so I think it's a good um, figure of speech for looking at the whole issue of transfiguration more generally and um, which of the characters are undergoing transfiguration in the novel. That's what it suggests to me. What is a fugue? It's um, it's riffing, right? On a what does it kind a specific kind of riffing? What happens to the melody in a fugue? Mm. 
it is doubled. It is either repeated or it is restated mm -hmm. and overlaid with the, the main melody in a, in a way that produces a pleasing set of sounds, but it is a doubling. And everything that is going on in this page is about hiding doubles. Notice the way that the, the, the doors open. When one door opens, it hides the, well, a door of it opens is hidden by the other. Um, the, it is a fugue, it is a fugue, it is, it is a doubling of, a tripling, a quadrupling of flavors, smells, scents, all playing together. But in fact, it is, it's a multiple. This, this, this cabinet contains everything that's in this book. It, it, it's about, this, this story may be about the doubling of persona the fracturing of persona, the, um, the dangers of empire, and it's all inside of Mrs. Chris Sparkle's closet. And uh, I just think it's, it's one of my favorite pages in all of Dickens because of that. Uh, there, are several, there are several critics that believe that Dickens at the end of his life only cared about his plot and you need not go no farther than this paragraph to argue that that is simply not true. So I hope if you didn't see all of that, or you didn't think about most or many or even some of those things while you were reading that, I hope you will go back and read it again uh, and maybe even come back to it uh, while you're, while, after you finish reading next month's. John. One thing I particularly enjoyed in this paragraph and it's in the sentence that contains the fugue reference, is the portrait of Handel uh, that is looking down uh, above it, a portrait of Handel in a flowing wig beamed down at the spectator with a knowing air of being up to the contents of the closet and a musical air of intending to combine all its harmonies in one delicious fugue. Um, <laughs> This is the, the artist, the composer. This is a figure for Dickens himself, who has composed this wonderful paragraph and is enjoying the fugue, uh, the, the repetitions that you have pointed out, and the harmonious blending of all of them into one composition. So it's a, a, a self-reference, I, I, I would suggest. Well, and it's quite autobiographical. If you go back to the appendix that shows Dickens' working notes, you will see this. He, in, he fully intended to include this description because he saw something like that when he was young. So once again, the pull of memory on Dickens is so powerful that something like 50 years, 40, 50 years later, he can recreate it in his last novel, Kathleen. Hi, I think um, it's a lot of food for a family of two, a household of two people. <laughs> it it uh, immediately said they were well off, um, more than well off. They had plenty of alcohol, and and this isn't even really the the main, the basic food that one needs. It's all the extras. So yeah, and I also thought it had a reference to uh, Empire, but it seems like this bit is um, is a device in the book rather than an actual description of a Victorian cupboard. Um, well, no, it apparently is an actual description, or at least it? as what. Well, uh -huh as a particular and unusual one that Dickens saw when he was a child. So he's transformed it into something magical. Okay. <laughs> Megan. Oh, are you, are you, I'm sorry, Kathleen. No, did you I'm have... done, thank you. Megan. Well, what do you make of it, Carl, that the control of this um, thing is given to Mrs. Cripps Sparkle. And when you uh, compare, think about the opening paragraph where she knows her mind and it's not going to change. She gives it to uh, her son when he doesn't agree with her. So he, he do doses, she what doses do you, him. What do you make of it, Megan? 
I asked first. <laughs> uh, no, that doesn't mean I'm going to answer first. No, I find it interesting because uh, if it's talking about doubling, it's or, and was it Karen who talked about the not crazy about the book because it is so off-putting. I too find it off-putting to be given under the reins of Mrs. Chris Sparkle, who a China doll, she's always put up on a shelf somewhere. She's not given a great deal of, she's given a great deal of love, but not a great deal of sense. Um, I have to think about it. Well, I would suggest that you keep looking at how um, the muscular Christian deals with the woman who is his mother and, and ask yourself how enlightened he might or might not be given the way he treats her. Um, and we'll come back to her a little bit later uh, when her objectification is complete. Mm -hmm. Anything more anyone would like to say about the closet? I could talk about it for uh, quite a while. Um, I really believe that some academic needs to write a, you know, a 30 or 40 page uh, thesis on uh, how this closet stands in for everything, that uh, all of which can be contained, uh, the multitudes that are contained inside of this book. But we, we shall move on. And we'll move on to something uh, in a couple of pages where we find out what Neville's feelings are about Edwin and... Um, is there anything about what, Ev what Neville said that struck you as very familiar to those of you who have read late Dickensian novels? Uh, Carl, before we move on, Alexis had her hand up. Alexis. Oh, I'm sorry, I missed that. I just wanted to say, Mrs. Chris Sparkle uh, may be someone who's just put up on her shelf, but she's also a domestic goddess. Uh, this is not necessarily just a uh, an indication of empire. This is a lot of work that has gone into pickling all sorts of preserves, making all sorts of jams, making the plum cake. This is uh, her, her domestic goddess role of which, you know, Dickens is so approving. This is what, what a mother should do. Even with her 35 year old son. Yes. That's right. <laughs> never ends, never ends. <laughs> Thank you so much for that. So uh, what does Neville say about, um, I mean, what's the reaction of Neville's statement? What does he say and how is it treated? I know you're just all quivering with potential responses. And I see Priscilla smiling, so I'll call on her. Priscilla, what, what, are you th what did you think about Neville's declaration? You're muted. Are you speaking about his declaration of his affection for? Uh, what, yes, what he says about Rosa particularly. Yeah. Actually, I was a little surprised of his of his declaration but i wasn't um uh yeah i was a little surprised uh, because it came so fast or because he was so unworthy what what well i think they see him as not being worthy of i think that they still see him as a different class in a way because of the situation of his younger life how he grew up he and his sister. Mm -hmm. Okay. That's, I might be wrong, but that's kind of, and I think uh, they are trying to change it. That impression he and his sister have. Well, he specifically calls her the beautiful young creature whom Edwin treats like a doll. And we have heard this before in another book. Which you just discussed. Does anyone remember the discussion in uh, Our Mutual Friend when Bella says, I want to be something so much worthier than the doll in the doll's house. So we have another view of a doll 
But this time we have a, a, a man who is not reacting to a woman who frankly is a little bit doll-like and acknowledging that she is a woman. And what I remind people of in the, the seminars that I lead is whenever a character says something about another character, it tells us two things. It tells us how the, char the character speaking feels and thinks, but it also gives us another view of that character. And if we accept Neville as a, well, he's not an impartial viewer, but he definitely is seeing Rosa as an adult woman. And I think it's good for us to keep that in mind. Glenna. Uh, yeah, I think that I'm still struck by the saccharine transfiguration. <laughs> I think Rosa is one of the characters who does really uh, transfigure in our eyes. She does at first seem like a doll and she becomes much more than that in the course of the novel. She acquires a moral weight and Neville recognizes that she has moral weight when almost nobody else around her seems to. Maybe his sister does, but um, everybody treats her like a doll because she's little and pretty. And Edwin Drew takes her very lightly. Um, you know, I think when you when you try when you start looking for evidence of characterization of women in Dickens, you need to look for these kinds of subtle clues. He he doesn't characterize his women in quite the same broad strokes. Well, maybe like Sarah Gamp or something, but the heroines, the their characters, their characters come out in more subtle ways, I think. And here is one of the signals that Rosa is perhaps a little better rounded as Dickens creates her, then she might appear to you. Um, so after that, um, after that scene, uh, well, I do want to, I, I do want to raise a question, I guess, uh, because Sept extracts a pledge from Neville that um, he will engage and in uh, trying to reconcile his uh, reactions and feelings with Edwin. And he asks that Neville pledge him the honor of a Christian gentleman. And it is the only reference that I could find anywhere as to what the, the uh, religious inclinations of the landlesses may be. Although there is a, a, a similar one, um, on the next page when Helena begs Neville to follow uh, Reverend Septimus all the way to heaven, whatever that means. You look puzzled, Marini. Did you have a question? No, did you have a question? I, okay, okay, so um, So Septimus is out for one of his muscular morning runs and he sees the, the, the landlesses and ends up in this, with this kind of unusual discussion. Um, what did you glean from that interaction? Megan, you need to unmute. I'm not going to answer. I'm just going to suggest that when you want a specific thing like this, Carl, if you give us the oh. page. Well, I'm, I'm running in around page uh, 105, 106. Because some of the silence might be us saying, now, where is he? What? And we're about, uh, you know, I'm working my way through the pages pretty chronologically because I think there's so much to, to mine here. So I'm still in the chapter smoothing the way and it's yeah, it's roughly where they're walking on the beach. So let's see, that is uh, the follow him to heaven is on page maybe 107, 108. 108. Thank you. The stuff I want you to read aloud, I did note those pages in the Penguin. I've actually been using the Everyman edition because it's easier to write in the pages for those of you 
who love your books too much. I, I write in them, so I buy them specifically in order to write in them. And then at the, well, at the end of that chapter, we find out that um, Jasper and Sept have another somewhat disagreement. We, we realize that, that Dickens is perhaps setting them up sort of as different centers of the novel in terms of thinking what's going on. But Jasper makes a pledge there at the, end, at the last end of the chapter that he will bring the two young men together uh, for dinner alone on Christmas Eve. And that's, that, in essence, really sets the plot moving. And then we change completely. And we are, we are now back, we are now in London, and we are in the, um, the very masculine secured chambers of, of, of the inns at court uh, and in Mr. Grugis's um, offices and apartments. Um, what did you make of the discussion between Mr. Grugis and, and, well, the whole visit, Edwin comes to visit, that whole chapter is honestly, in my view, strange. Irene, you had your hand up earlier. Did I, I'm sorry, did I miss that? That's okay. Uh, I was just going to try and answer the, the previous question about the, the Neville and uh, Septimus and the discussion between them. I was seeing it as coming from a different background. I was seeing uh, Mr. Crisparkle as much more rigid in his Christianity and his attitudes and uh, Neville as, not, as being someone whose emotions are not fully under control. And that's you know, seen by Mr. Chris Barkle as something he needs to control. He needs to be someone who is not allowing his emotions to run away with him and make decisions for him. Well, and I think back to who, whomever made that comment, uh, it's just another way that Neville expresses his otherness in the presence of this, uh, this, this angel in the house with this magical cabinet and her, her uh, preacher son who's you know 35 years old and still living with mom and it, it's you're right it's it's everything's very controlled and here is this extremely emotional young man and it, it's jarring I think to to the whole community apparently he's upsetting everything because he's he's got the tiger's blood in him but now we are in an even more sedate and uh, environment in, in Mr. Grugis's rooms. Marini. Well, I was going to respond to the- Go ahead. Um, Go ahead. To the earlier part. Um, Neville says at one point in that um, discussion, um, yes, I love Rosa and I hate and despise Drude. Um, and yet he um, allows us how he's going to try to control that. He is willing to control that in order to go to the dinner with Jasper and Drude. So anyway, I mean, he's- And, and why do you think that is? Why do you think- Why is he willing? Well, uh, um, well, perhaps I hadn't thought about it like this, but perhaps he can see that he's upsetting everything and that he's willing to smooth the way, that's the name of the chapter, to help smooth things, if that will do it, he he's willing to give that a try. And in fact, he does. And in fact, it's successful. Um, so okay. anyway, just in terms of his being, um, he is passionate, no, no doubt about it. And his emotions get the better of him, no doubt about it. But he is able to control them when he decides to, or if he feels that it's important to. I mean, is, is it important to note that he is also in the presence of his sister when he does this? Megan. Right. Yeah. I think it's interesting to notice how Neville is so uh, vivid against the background. You talk about Sept living with his mother at home, but there is um, the cathedral town where everything is uh, got a place and a purpose. This, this bright creature comes and uh, everything he does would upset them. 
And then now you've moved into what's his name, Egregious's office. Again, the background is um, oh, very staid and put together, all the bricks are in place, against which Edwin Drood comes off as a softy, a kind of uh, lightweight, it just doesn't fit. It's the background is not to his advantage, as Cloisterham is not to Neville's advantage. What besides being Rose's guardian, I mean, which is sort of a function of the the plot, how does Grugis function as a character here in this in this unusual chapter, in these uh, in this confined space where he gives Edwin Rosa's dead mother's ring. Blair. Uh, I find the most interesting uh, aspect of Bruges is, is not the ring that he introduces or that he is in charge of some trust, but the um, implications of him having a, had a romantic relationship somewhere in the uh, backstory of, uh, of the uh, sequence of events that lead to our, uh, our book, right? And what does, that, what does that past romantic involvement give him? I'm not really sure. I'm, I, I must confess that I do not do well with mysteries. I uh, seldom figure out who done it until I'm at the last page. I, I live with somebody who's brilliant at that. And so when we watch mystery movies and stuff, she's got it figured out in the first 15 minutes, I just go for the ride. So I'm sorry, Carl, I just really don't know the answer. Well, I don't, th I don't think that understanding Grugis has much to do with the mystery as it does with the fact that he is a he is a lover who has been frustrated in love. Uh, Trudy, we'll come back to that though. Trudy, uh, you're muted. Grugis is one of my favorite characters. Uh, and he reminds me a little bit of Mr. Lorry. I'm so glad you said that. I was going to prompt that. Yeah, uh, you know, Mr. Lorry always says, I'm just a man of business, I'm a man of business. But obviously, he isn't. And he has an understanding of the emotional situation. And uh, Grugius, uh, you know, he keeps saying that he's, um, what is his phrase? Not, I'm not a man of an business. An angular man. I'm an angular man. I'm an angular man. But he's not at all angular. <laughs> uh, yes, he's been disappointed in love. Uh, and I've known two people who have been very much like him. That disappointment has finished his hope of ever realizing um, uh, love. He's hung on to that, right? Uh, but he also has loved with a certain kind of depth. And to me, Edwin has no depth at all. <laughs> um, he's a man who uh, is, uh, you know, I mean, he doesn't really give a damn whoever it is. Yeah. <laughs> He, he figures, well, and when, when Grugis talks to him about what having this ring and what, you know, marrying um, Rosa should be, it's nothing like, it's something that um, Edwin is incapable of. So you know that Edwin should return the ring. <laughs> uh, and... Um, so I think I it's an interesting contrast for for this old man whose office is in well I, they're all younger than I <laughs> picture them but you know who whose office is in absolute apple pie order nothing is you know out of place um, who uh, basically is living off of um, 
I mean, has not really fully participated in the law. He's found a convenient way to uh, make a living uh, as a trustee. Um, but he sees, and Rosa has told him, Rosa has given him the note, right? And said, make sure Edwin gets this. Yeah. Am I right about that? It's been a while since I read it. The note. Well, when he meets with Rosa before this chapter. Right. And he says to Rosa, you know, you're not absolutely required to marry this man. Yes. And she and also Rosa thanks him for that information. And she gives him a note and he, she says, make sure that Edwin gets this. And uh, basically um, what he's giving, Ro uh, Grugis is giving Rosa a hope of having an out <laughs> uh, from, uh, from this uh, predetermined uh, betrothal and marriage. And he, um, I mean, he's the, he's the one to me that understands uh, the, um, the hollowness of the, of the relationship and the fact that it shouldn't really go forward. Okay, well, I do want to come back when when we have the interview between Rosa and Edwin, I want to come back to your comments about Edwin, but um, and whether he whether he is shallow or not. Um, well, I unfortunately, um, I had a car accident yesterday, so I'm not caught up with the reading. But I you know, when Neville and and uh, when Neville, and Edwin mix it up earlier. That picture, the, the the illustration is perfect of Edwin lounging in the hair in the chair. And if I were Neville, I would have been tempted to slug him too. Well, I have softened my attitude toward Edwin, and I'll come to. But we'll come back to that when we re, -re when we go over his interview yeah. with Rosa S Sylvia. Oh, hello there. Yeah, it's uh, gone nine o'clock at night here. Um, um, yes, I, I feel that um, Edwin, he's still very immature. He's still a very young young man. And uh, he, he's, they've been in, to, betrothed for some years. And he takes uh, um, young Rosa, it's very complacent about uh, young Rosa, but what I felt was very telling in that chapter, and I can't actually find the, the sentence, but Grugis is grilling him and saying, it, Mr. Grugis has obviously been in love because he's saying all the things how a young man in love would act. And he keeps saying to Edward, how would a young man who's in love act? And then Edward says something which I thought was very, very telling. Um, sometimes he doesn't know what he feels, something something like that. And I thought, yeah, they're obviously get, were intended to marry. They obviously really will fall in love. Um, um, I, I can't find that sentence, but I, I, thought, I thought that's really Edward is in love with Rosa. Uh, he's very young, very immature, and he, he, he can't really feel how he feels because he's not quite sure. And, I, and again, I think we'll come back to that when we see the two of them together. I do want to, uh, uh, Marini, are you still going to stay on this or do you want to talk about something else? Just a, a comment. Um, uh, so now I'm going to jump ahead just a little bit, but it's within our reading, so it's not a spoiler. I feel like his um, opening up the idea that Mr. Grugis is more rounded and understands emotion and has um, suffered, you know, through his feelings, and and you know, just anyway, just that. Um, later, when he suspects Jasper, um, it I think would, perhaps without this insight into him, it would have been surprising that such an angular wooden man would have insight into um, the drama <laughs> that, um, that Jasper has gotten himself 
messed up in just a, a thought. Uh, you know, I do. I really do think Trudy's onto something when, uh, and I wrote in my notes that I think that Grugis is a lot like Mr. Laurie and his attitude toward Rosa it reminds me very much of Laurie's attitude toward Lucy. But I want to read you something on page 121, which um, I, I had hoped someone would comment on. Uh, down near the, in that long paragraph where Mr. Grew just keeps talking and talking and talking, where he says, I don't know about this. I don't know anything about birds. I don't know anything about the habits of birds and this and that. I don't blah, 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 blah. But, and then he proves he knows a lot about a lot when he says, and if, um, let's see, da, 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 where is it? My picture does represent the true lover as having no existence separable from that of the beloved object of his affections and as living at once a double life and a halved life. And if I do not clearly express what I mean by that, it is either for the reason that having no conversational powers, I cannot express what I mean or that having no meaning, I do not mean what I fail to express. Um, he protests too much and he does remind me of another character. He reminds me a little bit of Polonius talking to Laertes and depending on how an actor plays Polonius, he can either be a boob or very wise or frankly evil as, as uh, uh, Richard Breyers played him in the Kenneth Branagh version. Um, but so, Gru just gives Edwin the ring, and the ring is a very important ring that was worn by the by um, Rose's dead mother, who was Gru long lost love. And we move on, and we move back into present tense in chapter twelve with the night with Dirtles. Um, and let's see. What is the, what, what's going on in, 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 this is a long chapter and, and this is the chapter where Dirtles takes uh, Jasper into the crypt and into the tower. And it's probably loaded with clues about what Dickens did or it did not intend to do with the mystery at the end. And it's, I guess it's, a, we can note some of those questionable comments. Um, one of them is on, page 131, where, um, let's see, near the end of the bottom of the page, um, the narrator comments, likely enough, the two, Dirtles and Jasper, little think of that now being alive and perhaps Mary, um, oh, I'm, I skipped something, let's see here. Da, da, da. Um, Oh, the two journeymen have left their two great saws sticking in their blocks of stone and two skeleton journeymen out of the dance of death might be grinning in the shadow of their sheltering sentry boxes about to slash away at cutting the gra out the gravestones of the next two people destined to die in Cloisterham. Likely enough, the two little think of that now, that now being alive and perhaps merry curious to make a guess at the two or say one of the two. So I think Dickens is perhaps suggesting to us that two people are going to die in Cloisterham. And who might they be? The stonemasons probably don't know or care at the moment. Um, so, um, Let's see here. What struck you about this chapter? Or was this a chapter that in your mind was pretty much plot driven? Lena and David have their hands raised. Lena. <clears throat> I'd like to ask a question. I mean, this is, I think, a remarkable chapter. Aside from being plot driven, I mean, just the talk about atmospherics. But I, my question is, I don't understand about going up into the tower and then into the crypt. 
what I don't know enough about the layout of a cathedral to understand how they go up to go down, or so it seemed to me. Well, I was when I was in Rochester, I was unable to go in the crypt because it was being renovated. But is it is down, and then of course the tower is up, and for some reason, Glenna, Dirtles and Jasper go both places, and so the question would be, why is that necessary? And there are all sorts of theories uh, for those people who have concluded the book as to why the reader needed to be taken on a trip to these two places early on in the book because they were going to play roles in, later in the book. Is that enough of an explanation for now? Yep. Okay, David. Uh, in rereading this time, I was feeling that Turtles' bundle is going to be significant in some way. Dickens keeps emphasizing the bundle. We don't know what's in it other than his lunch, but Turtles is reluctant to part from it and it keeps coming up. So I don't know what it's going to signify, but it seems to me he wouldn't mention it that often if he didn't have intentions for it. I think the keys are in his coat. And of course, um, Jasper has drugged, um, well, Jas Jasper has drugged Dirtles with something in that uh, carafe or whatever it is. And Dirtles has a fit of calenture, a word I had to look up. Um, it's a tropical delirium. And he dreams in his, in his stupor that something falls from his hand and he hears a clink. And uh, we if we remember back to the clinking from last week where Jasper's testing out the sound of Dirtles' keys so he can find the one that he needs, um, according to the completers, Jasper needs to do something with one of those keys and then replaces it on the floor. Um, on the ground near Dirtles, and Dirtles, even in his stupor, realizes he might have been drunk. Nancy. I just think it's interesting that um, Dirtles urges Jasper to recollect yourself. It's not the first time in the book that I've noticed that phrase used. Uh, I think Neville is urged to recall himself, and it reminded me again of Tale of Two Cities recalled to life. And I wondered if that was intentional. Does anyone have any insight into that? I just thought it was a, you know, a, a peculiar use of the word by Dickens to um, remember your manners or, or uh, call, you know, calm down. I think I, I thought it just as a, a different way of expressing that. That was my opinion. Alexis. You know, you asked earlier who the second person was who might might be done to death and I think it's Dirtles. He knows too much and Jasper is always looking at him very, very intently and Dirtles is aware of that. And it makes him it makes him uneasy. Um you know he, he really has a little too much knowledge of what's going on to be uh to be very safe, I think. Well that's an, you know we'll be able to talk a little bit about the completion of the story next next month. Uh, I've read at least 10 different completions and not one of them had Dirtles dying. So hmm. I, I, it's all I can, that's all I can tell you. Um, so of course, at the end of this, which is also the end of the monthly installment, um, Jasper Collar's deputy, once again, reminding us that Jasper and deputy are, I mean, deputy, deputy considers Jasper his sworn enemy. So um, and now we are into month four. And it, we're back to Miss Twinkleton's. Um, but Carl, but I'm sorry, oh, I forgot oh. to do my hand. Wait, I'll do it. Before we leave deputy, I, I, I do think it's worth noting that Jasper is horrified at the idea that deputy might know when they went in and when they came out, that he might've been following them. Um, Jasper, who has followed other people. But um, anyway, I just think that's worth noting. I mean, he just 
was terrified at that idea that the boy had seen them go in, waited, and then seen them go out. It would just give him information that Jasper wouldn't want him to have. That's all. Thank you. Glenna. Once again, I have a question. So far, and maybe do the completers make something more of deputy? I'm not sure what this stoning of, repeated stoning of dirtles is all about. It seems eccentric and, you know, it doesn't seem to have much role in the plot. They definitely make more of deputy because deputy can slip in and out of a situation without being seen. And so various completers have deputy knowing things such as uh, knowing a lot more about Princess Puffer and um, knowing what Jasper, where Jasper was. If Jasper says he wasn't somewhere, deputy might be able to say he was, was lying. So uh, I'm not sure what Dickens intended to do with him, but the completers often have deputy in the thick of things uh, in, in helping resolve some of the issues uh, at the time of the solution to the crime. David. As a, an experienced mystery reader, my idea is that deputy is going to be a, a useful witness having seen something that he should not have seen. Now, when I saw the musical, The Mystery of Edwin Drood on Broadway in 2014, which ends with the audience voting on various things, the night I was there, they voted that Deputy would end up marrying Princess Puffer, who was played by Cheetah Rivera. And Deputy is like 14 and Ms. Rivera was in her 70s. But it got, it got great audience response. Alexis. I apologize. I, I did not uh, mean to go forward with the comment. All right. There, there we go. Okay. So now we're back at Miss Twinkleton's and it is, um, it's Christmas, isn't it? Yeah. Um, Before so, you go on, uh, Cynthia, did you oh, have something I'm, to add? Cynthia. Yes, I'm sorry. I have a question as well. It seems to me that the way that Dirtles behaves and is described in his dreaming and waking and sleeping is very similar to the opening of Jasper's dreaming and waking and sleeping. And I'm wondering if we are just to assume that he's been given opium. Do you do you think? I don't know. I don't think so. I think that he's he's a chronic drunk, and so he's not believed. But the comment that we that we glossed over was when Dirtle says that he heard a scream and a dog barking on a previous Christmas Eve. Much is made of that clue in some of the completers' statements. Um, some people think it it was a sign of a past crime that has yet to be uncovered. And some of uh, another one that I read believes it is a psychic pre-statement of a future scream that is going to take place in the course of this time, story time. So um, I, I think though, Cynthia, that Jasper or that Dirtles is thought of as unreliable and therefore he will have some major thing that he will know uh, just like deputy. I mean, they're being played for laughs, but I think that they're going to, we're likely to hold some clue and, and we are being deceived by Dickens to discount them early on, or at least that the other characters in the story discount them. Certainly, uh, Sapsy will no would most likely be taken down a notch or two for, for his opinions of, of Dirtles. Does that make sense for now? Okay. Thank you, yes. Oh. So the, this next chapter is, is frankly really important. This is the meeting between Rosa and Edwin. And um, would someone like to summarize their impression of that really important exchange?
It starts on about page 146 or so and goes for five or six pages. Yeah, 146. Glenna. Well, I wasn't planning to summarize, but just to say that when Rosa takes the initiative, this is when we find out that, uh, you know, she has this moral weight because certainly in 19th century novels that I've read, heroines are not the ones that bring up things like this. Uh, well, if they're rejecting maybe, but it's unusual in literary heroines, young girls, uh, for them to have this much self-knowledge and, uh, and take initiative. And as he's being converted from um, lover to brother, I think this is when Edwin, who I do think is undergoing his own uh, transfiguration of a sort, this is when he begins to realize that she's more than a doll. Mm -hmm. I would, yes, uh, Megan. Well, I think Edwin gets it from Gregis a little and uh, is prepared because before, even in the beginning of their meeting, he he starts calling her Rosa and says he'll never call her pussy again. But um, so, yeah, I, I agree with Glenna. He's evolving slowly, whereas uh, Rosa, we're presented with something that was there and we, we hadn't seen before, but was there. Uh, I find it interesting that uh, Jasper is just still in the background in all of this, and that um, that final she would have asked him with imploring emphasis, "Oh, don't you understand?" And uh, he just he doesn't get it, and we don't get it, but we know that something's up, something's wrong. It's a great way to end a chapter. Yes, I'm looking for a specific thing. Um... Let's see here. So at the very bottom of 147, uh, Rosa says something like, um, you liked me, didn't you? You thought I was a nice little thing. And, and Edwin says, well, everybody thinks that, Rosa. And then Rosa says, surely it was not enough that you should think of me only as other people did now, was it? Glenna, I think that is a very mature observation uh, that she realizes that if he likes her just the way he likes everybody or that everybody likes her, that that's hardly special. Megan. Nope. Okay. Marini. Um, the, I just want to, when Megan said that <clears throat> Jasper is just in the, the background, he's literally, he he's followed them. Um, on page 152, kind of almost two thirds down, um, Edwin says, um, don't look round, Rosa, he cautioned her as he drew her, her arm through his and led her away. Didn't you see Jack? And she says, no, where? And he says, under the trees. He saw us as we took leave of each other. I think that's worth noticing because I think he's creeping around in another scene in, in the part that, you know, following people and um, kind of like deputying, being invisible. But anyway, he's literally in the background here because he's watching them creeping. Well, you'll get lots more creeping around next month. Um, <laughs> lots more, uh, but he's creeping around at, at a really important moment, Marini. And what is that? What does, what does he see? He says what appears to be the two of them um, um, together as, as if they're, they're staying together. They're, they are feeling the emotion of having agreed to come apart and yet still being so fond of each other and like a brother and sister, which still is a lot of love. And he sees the physical manifestation of that and misreads we assume that they have confirmed that they'll be married. Glenna. Yeah, I think the fact that, I mean, we began by discussing 
the opening of, of the chapter 10 and how women have insight into character and it's made into a joke in a way because Mrs. Mrs. Chris Barkle is not particularly astute. But Rosa is the one person who really apprehends how dangerous Jasper is. And that keeps coming up over and over again. Well, and it's not just, it, frankly, Dickens describes it, Marini, as a fervent kiss, which is not exactly brotherly, sisterly in my, in my mind. And I think it, it gets back to this issue, um, as we'll talk about a little bit more with, with Edwin. Um, Trudy, I think Edwin actually realizes when it's too late that he has lost something wonderful. Now, it doesn't prevent him from keeping his eye on the main chance and realizing that he's already thinking about Helena Landless. But I, I do think to give the characterization of young Eddie credit, I think he has a little more depth to him. I think Dickens gives us just a hint that Edwin is wise enough and not quite young enough to have missed the fact that he might have missed out on a wonderful woman. Sylvia. Sorry, the cat, the cat just came in then. Um, <laughs> yes, chapter 11, back, I, I found that a little bit. I'd actually made a note Great, of thank it. Thank you. Um, where Mr. Grugius is asking uh, Edwin, how would a, a man in love behave? Edwin, uh, I've got just the end of the sentence. Edwin says, not all deep feelings are revealed. And I think that's very, very telling. Yeah, thank you. Uh, Nancy. I noticed here there's a description of the moaning water casting its seaweed duskily at their feast. And it's not the first time in the book that seaweed is mentioned. And I wondered if any of the completers use seaweed in the plot at all? Is that something we're supposed to be noticing? I can't remember a single completion that doesn't take place inside the cathedral. That, uh, that that's, where, that's where the big climax is always seen. Somebody's, somebody's uh, murdered in the cathedral or, or buried in the crypt or dug up from the crypt or thrown from the tower or uh, Definitely, there are some where people jump off the tower or pushed off the tower or whatever. Um, but I cannot remember a single one that involves seaweed. Sorry. <laughs> Megan. Awesome. Your, your comment about Edwin Drood and his um, depth is repeated on page 158 when he frankly wonders if, with some misgivings of his own unworthiness, uh, if he had set a higher value on her. Exactly what you'd said. But still in all, that remains Helena Land, um, Landless. Well, I actually, and I believe he cried. He cries somewhere. Yes, he wept. He wept. Yes. So, I mean, he's 20 years old. And I, I think tw at tw in those days, 20 was maybe a little older than it is to us. But um, I just think he has found out just a little too late that a chance passed him by. But, but he's careless, Carl. He wants Scrooge's to do the telling of, of Jasper. He, he likes the easy way. He's not, um, he, he doesn't do things, except he's going to change all of Egypt. Well, why does he want Scrooge's to tell Jasper? So that he doesn't have to. No, well, that's not, well, yes. But yes, why? it is. But it why? Is. He's afraid of him. He says he that outright. Is. Sometimes I'm a bit. Of, he says sometimes I'm a bit afraid of him. He's not. He's not like uh, Rosa cowering in terror. No, sure. but he's a man admitting fear to his uncle. I, I, I think that's a, frankly, a bold revelation for a young man. Frankly, Carl, we are all afraid of Jasper. <laughs> <laughs> and but well, Carl, we... doesn't he go on to say that um, that he's afraid that um, that Jasper will fallen a swoon on the floor um the heat he's not I, I, I don't know where it is but i don't i don't well, think he's afraid of him the way rosa is right. he's afraid of hurting him 
Yes, he calls him a little womanish. So he's not, you know, he he doesn't have the strong emotions of a man. He's or the strong control of a man. Um, but of course, he's also pretty clueless about Jasper. So we have to take those reactions with a grain of salt, don't you think? Yes. <laughs> okay. Um, when shall these three meet again? <laughs> I think this is one of the best chapters Dickens ever wrote in any book. It's, I just think it's wonderful. And I hope you do too. But I want to, um, let's see here. Where do I, um, who would I like to tap? Um, I'm gonna tap you again, Bill, cause I know you're a good reader. Would you read the first chapter, uh, the first paragraph of this chapter? Christmas Eve in Cloisterham. A few strange faces in the streets, a few other faces, half strange and half familiar. Once the faces of Cloisterham children, now the faces of men and women who come back from the outer world at long intervals to find the city wonderfully shrunken in size, as if it had not washed by any means well in the meanwhile. To these, the striking of the cathedral clock and the cawing of the rooks from the cathedral tower are like the voices of their nursery time. To such as these, it has happened in their dying hours afar off, that they have imagined their chamber floor to be strewn with the autumnal leaves fallen from the elm trees in the close. So have the rustling sounds and fresh scents of their earliest impressions revived when the circle of their lives was nearly traced and the beginning and the end were drawing close together. I think anyone that could use the word autumnal deserves some special praise. Um, Again, I, I think we, we see Dickens at the very end of his life. Um, I think, I can't remember, I'm probably misquoting him, but I think Wilkie Collins says this was the product of a tired or diseased mind. And I certainly don't see uh, tired or diseased in, in a paragraph that's this lyrical and, and wonderful. Um, it does strike me as a, a, when the, when the weather and the circumstances of the weather tend to reflect or tend to suggest to us the, the mood that characters are feeling, it is, I think, a form of what is called the pathetic fallacy, where you can draw inferences from a description of weather or trees, or maybe in Thomas Hardy, even the way of behavior of sheep, um, how the characters might be feeling. Marini, you're muted. Sorry, um, this is this is one instance where I feel like the editor overshared in the notes because he explains to he explains that when um, or he puts in the notes that when Dickens went back to Rochester, he at one point remarks um, that it seemed so small compared to his memory. So it, it's a, literally a childhood memory. And then the autumnal leaves apparently comes from the deathbed scene of Dickens' sister, Fanny, that she said to him, I almost wish I didn't know that, that she said to him that she could smell the leaves in her sick room that, that she remembered from their childhood. It's almost too much sharing. It, it's, because it's such beautiful writing, it gets in the way, the autobiography. So uh, this, I mean, this is such an unusual chapter in that, uh, well, I'll, I'll, first of all, I'll go on. Well, uh, go ahead, Bill. So this is, again, um, Carl, to your point about doubles, these are people who are living both in the present and in the past. Um, and uh, the, the point I've been harping on, the, the distortions of um, perception, uh, how things are colored by uh memories and uh it, it makes uh the reality appear different uh and and just um i think sets that 
uh, sets up uh, the three different characters who are looking at essentially sort of the same situations from very different perspectives and helps um, uh, provide a, a uh, context within which to understand those different perspectives. Gwena. Yeah, I just wanted to say this paragraph in the phrase autumnal leaves makes me think of uh, Sonnet 73, that time of year thou mayst in me behold when yellow leaves or few or none do hang upon those boughs. And I'm I'm not familiar with that one. I assume that's a Shakespeare sonnet. Yep. Certainly would have been known to Dickens and, and especially in a chapter that is a direct quote from Macbeth. Um, so much happens in this chapter. It, it, uh, I think that Dickens has borrowed a, a technique from Wilkie Collins in that he shifts narrative points of view very quickly. Uh, in, I mean, if you're really going to be generous to him, you could say that he even prefigures the kind of stream of consciousness of Virginia Woolf by moving quickly from Neville to Edwin to Jasper. Uh, but this is a, I, I think this is a narrative technique that you don't see very much in Dickens. He usually, in his, particularly in his monthly or his, his big triple decker monthly installment novels, tended to write long, sustained chapters that were highly scenic and using omniscient narrators or even first person narrators. And here we have uh, a narrator that moves almost, again, kind of like Virginia Woolf or Henry James from one character to another. And it's, it's, it's beautifully scenic. It reminds me of watching a movie, um, but we have all three of these men and it culminates in us uh, learning uh, that they all meet climbing up the postern stair of Jasper's gatehouse. Um, but Edwin meets the princess, and what what happens there? I mean, Neville get Neville buys a big heavy stick. Okay, well that's a clue of something. I mean, it's either a red herring or it's a clue. But um, although I did notice that he was going to be gone two weeks to conquer myself and bring wholesome fatigue, which I assumed was a euphemism for. Um, for sex, but let's talk about Edwin and the, and the princess. Anybody? That happens roughly on, starting on 158 and he meets the princess on 160, it looks like. Megan. Carl, I'm still stopped on wholesome fatigue. Um, it, it gave me no clue of uh, healthy sex. Uh, it just reminded me of Dickens walking around and around and around, and just the exhaustion brought to you by fatigue. Perhaps I was too long a lower school teacher. Who knows? Well, <laughs> perhaps you aren't a 20 year old man who was got a big stick and he's going to use it and in love with a woman whose affections he cannot or, or he that he cannot express well at any rate why else, why else would you go on a two-week walk princess puffer warns him <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah let's talk about edwin and princess puffer uh she she gives him a, a direct warning it's it's uh almost like a uh esp kind of thing she doesn't know who he is she just wants to check his name and she wants some money it's like uh, good mrs brown giving uh although she had more information giving um edith granger her fortune well she isn't there in order to warn Ed edwin she's there for some other reason entirely and what is that to follow jasper i mean she's trying to find jasper but she missed him because money from give him drugs. She's this drug dealer. I think she has a very specific reason for having gone all the way to Cloisterham to find one of her clients. Megan again. 
Well, being as she's got some inside information, she's probably wanting to blackmail him. He's uh, perhaps it's something he has muttered in his. Uh, there you uh, go. That's delivery. yes. There you go. Thank you so much. That maybe it wasn't unintelligible after all. Well, uh, Bill, I think maybe he owes her money, and uh, Jasper, I get the sense, uh, may not be able to pay. And that's one of the reasons he's interested in Rosa, because Rosa's going to come into a lot of money. Okay, that's in, all right. I hadn't thought about that. That's an interesting, that, that, that's an interesting motive. I, I do think it's a little, uh, my view is it's a little more straightforward than that. I think he's been in London smoking some opium and he's muttered something again. And this time he's muttered that he's, something bad's going to happen to somebody named Ned. And she just, in a Dickensian way, stumbles upon somebody named Ned uh, and, and tells him something. And so... Um, so, Carl, I'll, I'll add, he's got to get Ned out of the way to get his hands on the money. <laughs> well, yes. Yes. But Edwin does something else that's, that is extremely important to the storyline uh, before he runs into Princess Puffer. What, what is that, David? Or whatever you were going to say. I was going to say, uh, since we've got a Macbeth reference, that we're getting a Beware the Ides of March moment. And the thing that, <coughs> plot point is the, the watch and the jeweler. Yes. He goes to the jeweler who's, thank God, talkative. And, oh yeah, Jasper was just in here the other day and he seemed to know all the jewelry, that, the, the only jewelry that you carry around. Um, yes, I, that, I think that this is a plot line. And then, then we have the Jasper, uh, Nancy. Oh, I'm on. Uh, Jasper says the ominous thing that sounds harmless, but could be interpreted. Where is it? Something about, I'm going to pamper my nephew because he won't be around much longer. Was that when he's going to the stores and buying the little, the little sweet meats or the little delicacies or whatever? Cause his, cause, cause Edwin's going back. I mean, theoretically Edwin's going somewhere um right you could interpret it that way or you could interpret it as he won't be on this earth much longer i guess he certainly could that is true so i i know it bugs megan that after these three people walk into the uh walk into jasper's room it's suddenly the next day. And, um, and stuff has happened in the night. Stuff that may or may not be intrinsically important to the outcome of the novel. What has happened in the night? Yeah. Marini. Uh, I feel like before we go there, we have to, um, notice that Jasper is clicking his heels with happiness. He's in a wonderful mood. And Chris Sparkles says, oh, my goodness, I've never seen you so happy. And he says, yes, I'm just happy. You know, it's like Scrooge at the end. <laughs> happy as can be, which is so strange for him. Um, so he's the other two are dreading the dinner and or at least Neville is. Edwin, maybe not so much, but, um, and well, he's just happy. And right, and Sept says, you know, you must be trying a new medicine for that occasional indisposition right. that you had. Um, maybe so. Uh, yes, Megan. I just want to touch on that. Um, he's been in beautiful voice and never had been in more beautiful voice. What is giving him that? Because it, it's a honor and glory of God voice, you know, that he's singing. There is something that is elating him beyond uh, his normal reach. 
Oh, and what happened overnight was a dreadful storm. Yes, indeed. And, and uh, the hands of the clock have fallen off and stones have fallen from the roof. And the completers make a great deal of those two events. Uh, David. Since I got into Julius Caesar, uh, this is one of those uh, Shakespearean moments where the heavens reflect what's going to happen yes. on, on the earth. Oh, and I forget whatever the phrase is, it's not storms and alarms, it's something like that. Um, and, and the wife has this terrible dream. It's, it, there's a lot about that stuff, yes. Um, but it is a terrible, terrible storm. Chimneys topple in the streets. Um, let's see here, where is this? Where is this? Um, yes, the hands of cathedral clock are torn off. The lead from the roof has been stripped away, rolled up and blown into the close. And some stones have been displaced upon the summit of the great tower. Storm damage or something else? We'll never know for sure. And then Jasper, of course, breaks into a group of what I would call the usual suspects. I think Dirtles and Mr. Tope and and uh, is is not Sapsy's not there, but and says, "Oh my God, have you seen Edwin? He hasn't. He went to look at the storm, and he's never come back." Um, And then the scene shifts again dramatically, and we are on the road with Neville Landless. Um, what th it's the next day, and what's going on here? Okay, so Neville and his big stick are uh, accosted on the road by some burly guys, one of whom says that Neville is, has the build of a girl next to his own. I'm not really sure um, that I would have said that about him based on the drawings of him, but um, maybe this is a big burly dude. Um, and he's, he's rushed back to uh, town brought in front of Mr. Sapsey, whose who's import, self-importance has even been further enhanced by him becoming the mayor. Um, and let's see here. Once again, we are reminded by um, Mr. Sapsey that, uh, that Neville has an un-English complexion in case we needed to be told that. Um, but that's probably not the most important thing that happens in that uh, this, this chapter. And this is the last chapter that we have for today. So we, need, we should spend a little bit of time on it. A um, couple of weird things happen in this chapter. What are they? Where are you? What? Episode? Well, I'm. I'm just wrapping. You know, we're wrapping up the the, the um, chapter sixteen devoted. And uh, we're going to skip over Mr. Grugis and. Oh well, no, no, not. But let's it. let's talk about Mr. Grugis. Yes, let's talk about Mr. Grugis seeing what. Go ahead. Who, me. Yes. <laughs> um. Well, Mr. Grugis comes as he is supposed to come and Edwin is um, missing and um, Jasper has been frantically working with the other people physically looking for him in the on the river and all around the river and he comes home exhausted and to find Mr. Grugis there. Um, who and Grugis, I, I think he's so interesting in this scene because he he keeps that wooden, he says essentially, oh, tut, tut, I hear something terrible has happened. I mean, here this huge tragedy has happened from Jasper's point of view. And um, 
he asked about his um, his ward, Rosa, and then he gives the news to Jasper that um, that that he's already given to the two young people that they are not required by the will to marry, and Jasper just faints dead away <laughs> in a swoon or a fit. He says um, because he says when he recovered. When John, ja John Jasper recovered from his fit or swoon, um, and it's just as um, Edwin Drood had predicted. However, what I find interesting is that it's not in the text; it's only in the caption of the um, of the picture of Mr. Grugis by the fire. It says Mr. Grugis has his suspicions, but it, it I don't think. I mean, unless someone else, unless I missed it, I don't think the text says anything about that. And Grugis is standing in front of the fire, opening creepily, opening and closing his hands. And I get the feeling sort of, um, this is the scene that I was referring to when you find out that he's more, he has more dimensions than just this woodenness. Um, he suspects something he's not even just in this short scene he is suspicious of jasper i think of, of the way jasper has reacted and he's just not reacting himself he's keeping his feelings under wraps but he's um, kind of giving him the eye. That's how I interpret it anyway. Well, there's, uh, again, this is one of those areas where some of the completers have really focused on the fact that Grugis stands there and, and that we don't know what he does until we find out the Topses have come to take care of him at, to take care of uh, J uh, Jasper at, at Grugis's request. And so what was Grugis doing? in the room when he, when he didn't, you know, he doesn't take immediate action. The fact that this man is uh, shrieked and turned into a puddle of miry clothes on the floor and, and Grugis does nothing but wring his hands. Or uh, Megan. Oh, I've just forgotten what I was going to say. I, oh, I find it interesting that introduced very quickly here is um, Jasper saying, ah, you've given me great hope. Once he comes to, uh, it means that my my dear boy has gone away and will come back. So that it, that's introduced, and the chapter later, it's destroyed. It would it's in one sense, it reminds me of Jasper thinking on his feet. How can I use this piece of information that I didn't know? What will this do? Blah 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 blah. And the other, it's like why 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 bring it in if you're going to destroy it next chapter? We need some more time to think about it. We. The characters or we the readers? We the readers. Okay. Um, yeah, I'm sorry, I looked ahead. I was I con conflated two of the chapters with by looking at the wrong spot on my notes. I did not intend to overlook that, Marini. So thank you for calling it to my attention. Um, y yes, and you're right. That's exactly what happens next, Megan. That um, that. Jasper even imagines that that Edwin could be cruel to him by going away without telling him, um, and that that uh, oddly enough makes uh, Septimus a little confused um, or conflicted. And and then Septimus does something quite odd that that doesn't make any sense to us perhaps or, or and even to him. What does he do? Megan again. Well, he fans the flame. He provides more reason why Neville has done, might have done the dirty, given him more um, of a reason for hating Edwin. And then he walks to the weir. As Not he often does and says when he gets there, I don't know why I'm here. How did I get here? Right, because He's, according to the text, he's two miles away from where Edwin and Jasper were, were allegedly or told, we're told that they were going to watch the storm. And um, 
it makes him have a strange idea. He then dreams of the weir that night and goes back the next morning. And because he has exceptional vision and exceptional muscular Christian uh, uh, techniques and skills, he jumps into the water and he finds the watch and the stick pin. Um, and so, um, Let's see, I want to read something aloud. So let me find that as we're getting close here. Let's see. Oh, yes. So he comes back to, uh, he, he comes back to Cloisterham and immediately takes Neville. Oh, Trudy, you have something. You are uh, muted, Trudy. I just thought you were looking for where he found the watch, and that's on 182. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, we're, yeah, I want to stay on those pages for a while. Um, let's see here. Yes, he does find that, but he takes um, he takes Neville back to that. But I really wanted to talk about the rumors. So let me see where those rumors are. And I'm going to pick on, uh, let's see, who am I going to pick on? Blair, do you have your book open to page 182? Oh. I'm afraid oh, my got... dog is barking. All right, well, we'll I'll, I'll, I'll let you have a pass then on that. I'm sorry, I forgot about the puppy. Um, I also have the Oxford edition, so I'm uh, a, bit, a bit lost. All right, well, I will call on David Brownell then. If you'll start, uh, David, and read that, that long paragraph that starts at one, on the bottom of 182 with these discoveries. With these discoveries, he returned to Cloisterham and taking Neville Landless with him, went straight to the mayor. Mr. Jasper was sent for, the watch and shirt pin were identified, Neville was detained, and the wildest frenzy and fatuity of evil report arose against him. He was of that vindictive and violent nature that, that but for his poor sister who alone had influence over him and out of whose sight he was never to be trusted, he would be in the daily commission of murder. Before coming to England, he had caused to be whipped to death sundry natives, nomadic persons encamping now in Asia, now in Africa, now in the West Indies, and now at the North Pole, vaguely supposed in Cloisterham to be always black, always of great virtue, always calling themselves me and everybody else Massa or Missy, according to sex, and always reading tracts of the obscurest meaning in broken English, but always accurately understanding them in the purest mother tongue. He had nearly brought Miss, uh, Mrs. Chris Parkle's gray hairs with sorrow to the grave. Those original expressions were Mr. Sapsey's. He had repeatedly said that he would have Mr. Chris Parkle's life. He had repeatedly said he would have everybody's life and become in effect the last man. He had been brought down to Cloisterham from London by an eminent philanthropist. And why? Because that philanthropist had expressly declared, I owe it to my fellow creatures that he should be, in the words of Bentham, where he is the cause of the greatest danger to the smallest number. Did anyone have to read that paragraph more than once? Marini, comment. What 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 was I, it? The um it, I thought I'd lost my mind for a moment. <laughs> you know, I was reading along and thinking, wait, what? Are we hearing the history of Neville? And then then I came to my senses and realized it was about rumors. Um, I just want to say the very next sentence, and it's just got to be 
read out loud um, after the smallest number. These dropping shots from the blunder buses of blunder headedness might not have hit him in the vital place. It's just such a, a funny thing. But no, these rumors are dreadful. And it, it's exactly how, how the world works. Well, did you have trouble with the content or the syntax or both? I, I think I had trouble with the action in the beginning. He was brought to the mayor. He was detained. He was, and then the wildest frenzy and fatuity of evil reporter rose against him. I, I, and then the the list of things. There just there wasn't a break. My my brain is sort of with him, under arrest, and then um, it seems to be adding information anyway about two or three sentences in, I realized, no, no, this is not about him. These are the rumors, um, so. Did anyone else have trouble with this? Care to comment on this paragraph? It's so racist. I forgot to say that. <laughs> okay, That's Megan? Um, those of those people who were lucky enough to attend the uh, Pickwick yesterday, they talked about the stranger's use of talking in dash dashes and how it made you have to slow down and listen to it. And there is a certain amount of dashing in these rumors. You can just see the same kind of um, bits and pieces, just toss, 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 toss that you had there. Trudy. You're muted, Trudy. There this is one of the many places that I find that uh, Dickens is so relevant to our times. Um, that it's it's so contemporary. This is exactly what happens when somebody, you know, uh, who is who an outsider, right? <laughs> with darker skin than some people, um, uh, gets arrested. And the, this, this is exactly the kind of talk that goes on and, and ends up often convicting a person uh, who is totally innocent. But I, I, I find so much in this book that is very, very contemporary. And this is one paragraph I think that is. I don't know if anybody else feels that, but uh, I think we see that happen today. Thank you, Bill. The uh, evil reports that are offered are things that strike me as um, descriptive of the crimes of the British Empire. And so N Neville is sort of becoming the the face of all the things that the British Empire did wrong to its col uh, to the people in the colonies. Mm -hmm. um, let's see, I missed that. Um, yes, and I actually think that Dickens's syntax is deliberately convoluted. While the while the sentences are written in parallel structure, very much like uh, the opening of Tale of Two Cities. Within some of the sentences, the, the, the syntax is complicated enough that you have to slow down and think about it, or maybe it represents the convoluted and confused wackadoodle thinking of the people who are actually saying these things. I think all of that might be in there. Um, and so the Dean orders Septimus as part of his authority, I guess, and uh, I admit I don't understand very much about the the Church of England, and if anyone is an expert on that, um, I'd be happy to be educated, orders Septimus to send Neville away. And so we will find that that happens. Uh, David. Uh, that paragraph, it seems to me, uh, Dickens is very much in control of the syntax. 
when he writes a very long sentence, he never loses it. As for the dean and Septimus, the dean is in charge of the cathedral and the people who work for the cathedral. So that's why he has authority here. Well, I, I wasn't suggesting that it was an ungrammatical paragraph. I was suggesting that Dickens, because he is in such control, is able to make you slow down and perhaps feel the jumble of grammatically correct yet syntactically awkward phrasing that brings out each and every one of those crazy uh, allegations about Neville. Nancy. What are we supposed to be making about all these references to Macbeth? There are so many of them that I've got, you know, you've got to think that this is very deliberate. And I mean, the only thing I could come up with is this is a story about guilt. But there's also the, the naming of that chapter, you know, when shall we three meet again? That's about the weird sisters, but Neville, Jasper, and I uh, know Edwin are sort of stand-ins for them, but Princess Puffer is more like one of the weird sisters, but there's only one of her. So it kind of seems jumbled up in my head. And did you have any, did you have any thoughts about why there might be a plethora of Macbeth references other than <laughs> Dickens' new Shakespeare backwards and forwards? I wondered what it would mean to, to um, people in that time. I, to me, that's all I could come with. Well, this is a story about guilt, guilt, ringing guilt. That's what I think of. And maybe supernatural forces getting or persuading characters to do things, you know, that they might just be considering. And uh, well, I can tell you there's at least one completer who believes that the chapter is titled When Will These Three Meet Again is a question that will be answered because these three will meet again. but we'll never know. David. The murder of the king in Macbeth is a violation of hospitality. And Jasper has just hosted uh, Edwin and Neville. I think that's the connection. That certainly could, that is certainly one potential. Um, and the fact that there are, you know, these three are in fact meeting and it's a, it's a momentous, uh, it's a momentous meeting, although you're right in, in the context of Macbeth that, that is spoken by the, uh, it's the opening line of the play, isn't it? Um, it is the opening line of the play. Uh, so we're going to wind up for, for our next time. Um, I am going to have uh, Courtney, I have a, a an article that is um, that I'm going to send out, and I need to look at it for just a second before I talk about what it, it is. So, in the early 20th century, a man named Andrew Lang wrote a very length. And Andrew Lang was a Scottish writer who's mostly been forgotten. But everybody who's ever read anything about Edwin Drood knows what he thought about uh, Edwin Drood. And he said, if um, Edwin were murdered, there would be no mystery about it. And he has written, he wrote an article in 1905 that I'm going to have Courtney uh, attach to the next invitation, but I am asking you not to read it until you have finished reading the assigned pages because I'm asking you to think about reading it. It offers, frankly, a superb summary of the material that Dickens wrote. And he draws attention to certain very small details that, frankly, I missed in seven or eight readings. And he particularly asked questions well, what was Grugis doing between the time that he wrung his hands and the time the next chapter opened up? Those are the kinds of things that he calls your attention to. And it, will, some, it may drive you crazy, it may not. But he also examines some, and it's about 25 single space pages. I, I lifted it off a of Project Gutenberg and turned it into a Word document and I'll send it to Courtney or PDF, I can't remember which I did. Uh, 
But it's it's very dense, but it also is extremely thorough. And if you thought you had read carefully, you haven't read as carefully as Mr. Andrew Lang has. Um, and he debunks some of the completion theories and he comes up with his own. So we will talk about next month. I mean, we will have some time when we get finished to talk about some of the major completions. Uh, I, there are several hundred. I've read two or three of them seriously. I read the Leon Garfield one from 1980, which was the first one I read. And um, I skimmed it again a couple of weeks ago. There are, are various other theories. And then we'll, I, I would like you to think about whether it matters. Honestly, I would like to spend more time talking about whether it matters whether it was finished than how it might have been finished uh, in terms of our reading experience as 21st century uh, devotees of Dickens. So are there any questions for the good of the order before we adjourn today? Well, hearing none, I wish you a good afternoon. The skies have just opened in Oregon. Uh, so it's uh, raining cats and dogs here at the moment. And I will Thank see you. You, we'll see you all next month. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you.